So let's begin by reading verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So one can argue here that the author is making outrageous claims. Hmm. On what basis is he making these outrageous claims that make them not outrageous? Well, first of all, why might they be outrageous? I'm not sure, but I'm thinking, would it be because they claim they all had strong faith and maybe they didn't? No? Uh, no. I mean, you know, you can argue that he leaves out the weaknesses of Abraham's faith, but that, you know, in many ways is not terribly, I mean, Certainly, Abraham had strong enough faith, even though he, you know, perhaps had some lapses as in, and, you know, ethical issues as in lying about Sarah being his sister twice and in, you wow. know, in, uh, in listening to Sarah when, or Sarai when, when uh, she says to have intercourse with Hagar. And you know, forcing God's hand to produce an heir. But you know, despite that, his faith is strong enough. So it's not really an issue of faith. So what is it? Well, they were still seeking a homeland. And you know, this is being heard by people who have a homeland. So that's what was outrageous? Well, they would be wondering why, you know, that, that they, that they're seeing it from afar and acknowledge themselves to be strangers and aliens on earth. So probably wondering where the, where the, where they are. He reinterprets or he reimagines the biblical record to make them desire a better country that is a heavenly one. There's no, well, at some level, there's no basis for that. Hmm. So he's reimagined scripture in a very creative way. This sentence about, therefore, God is not ashamed to be mm -hmm. called their God. I mean, really? Mm -hmm. God, why would God be ashamed? <laughs> mm -hmm. to, and to who? <laughs> that, that's a, that's a, a literary device. It's called a uh, litete. Mm -hmm. huh. So litete is, is an ironic understatement. So to say God is not ashamed is to say that God is proud or, um, yeah, God is proud, uh, God is honored, God is whatever. Oh, okay. We, we see the same, we see the same construct in chapter two, verse 11, where I didn't point it out. Um, that is why he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Oh, okay. So it's not that he's not ashamed. He's proud to call them brethren, or he's honored to call them brethren because they have the same origin. In terms of even Christ's ministry, remember the conflict between, uh, or for that matter, remember Paul is, is being, uh, I don't remember 
this is an Acts, and I don't remember where, but remember Paul is being um, accosted by the Sadducees and Pharisees, and he begins a discussion of the resurrection. And a fight breaks out between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which allows him to escape mm -hmm. because they don't be the uh, Sadducees don't believe in resurrection. So remember, Sadducees believe in Torah, and that is the Bible. So within that context, the promises of God are material. And there's real no real concept of an afterlife. Oh. And especially remember what the author here is talking about, the city of God. And so it's not consummated until after the resurrection. So Fundamentally, in Judaism, there until late in Judaism, there is no concept of the afterlife. You die and you go somewhere, but it's a you know kind of lifeless place. You're dead. Mm -hmm. In that sense, the author has, you know, you can argue, transformed the biblical record. reimagined the biblical record, reinvented the biblical record. The question is, what gave him license to do so? And is it legitimate that he did? Well, they say that there are strangers and aliens on earth, as in um, Psalm 39, I am a sojourner. Journer on Earth. Mm -hmm. So they're seeking a homeland. Right. But Earth isn't it. Right. So that's implied. Yeah. By the song. To, to kind of help the discussion, he said, these all died in faith. Not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar. So the, 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 the first question is, who are these? Uh, so, you know, the possibility are that they're Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or that they're Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Which one do we think they are? Do you think they are? Well, Abraham was one that was promised. Uh-huh. Right. And Isaac and Jacob inherited the promises. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are promised. But um, Abel... Enoch and Noah weren't promised. Right. So these all are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Besides Psalm 105, which is the Psalm of David, there's also Psalm 119. It's a very long psalm. Mm. Good news, we're not going to read it all. <laughs> it's um, 176 verses long. <laughs> so the psalm is about um, the glory of God's law. And it's, it's a psalm about really a, a, a request for Great for grace to follow God's commandments. And in verse 19, he says, I am a sojourner on earth. Hide not your commandments from me. 
So seeing God as the reward and following God's commandments as the way of drawing close to God. If God's commandments are hidden from you, you can't draw close to God and therefore have no life and have no blessing. So a sojourner. Then the the notion that the the patriarchs that Abraham, that Isaac, that Jacob, that Joseph are sojourners occurs you know, repeatedly in Genesis. There are you know a large number of references. And then also remember, for the most part, they're sojourning in the land that was promised them. Mm -hmm. So the implication of sojourning in the land that is promised you is that something better, that the promise refers to something better. And the promise of Canaan is merely a type that points forward to the greater promise. The sojourning in the land promised is a type that points forward to being in the land promised. That in turn points forward to the land that is a greater promise or the city that is a greater promise. So, so the author here is saying this very much typologically. We have the type, we have the antitype, that antitype points forward to yet uh, another antitype. So in the land of the promise, they lived uncomfortable lives in tents, knowing that they were living in the land of the promise. So that's one thing. What what else is he basing his argument on? So we have they were sojourners. They were actually much of the time sojourning in the land that they had been promised. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 23. This is the death of Sarah. Start at verse 1. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kirloth Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Oh, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our sepulchres. None of us will withhold from you his sepulchre or hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machbala, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a possession or a burying place. And we can stop there. So this is the land of the promise. And Abraham is asking to buy a burying place, a, a sepulcher resting place for Sarah when God has granted him the land. So he is a sojourner. So we have sojourning in the land of the promise 
so what else is there that the author has developed isn't necessarily mentioning here, but is an important part of his argument. How do we know there's a heavenly city? God said he was going to prepare one for them. Mm -hmm. Where do you say that? It says that in 16, the, end, the last part of 16. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Which is different from just a place. But, I mean, a city that, has its foundation, right? But, 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 that that's the, but that's the author saying that. Oh, okay. I thought that's what you were asking. Yeah, I mean, he is talking about, I mean, the, the, the heavenly city is the same thing as the uh, a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, from uh, from verse um, ten. But but where where is is he getting that notion of a heavenly city from, and that they look forward to the heavenly city? You have to go back to the earlier chapters. Well, chapter nine is the earthly and the heavenly sanctuary. It talks about that. Mm -hmm. What is there in his argument that, you know, has something other than an earthly destination? Mm. Remember, remember, the whole issue of entering rest in chapters three and four. That was a long time ago. <laughs> um, uh huh. But remember that that the author that the author's argument is very tightly integrated, and exactly. and he's really drawing on that. It's a theme that he kind of left in obeyance, uh, obeyance, abeyance. Um, as he moved on to Jesus as high priest. So remember the wilderness generation was not allowed to enter the promised land. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Let's let's look at that. It's not numbers. Chapter 20, <laughs> verses 1 through 13. And the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of sin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and said, would that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? So now that's really significant because he re remember he talks about how Abraham could have gone back. He could have returned to, to, uh, to Ur. He could have returned to Haran. But instead, he continued to sojourn. It, it implies that, and he sojourned in the land that he had been promised, which all of which, which implies one, no going back. And two, even though he was in his destination, he wasn't in his destination. So this is a contrast with the uh, wilderness generation. Why you made us come up out of Egypt, bring us to this evil place. It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. And there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. So then they're supposed to produce, the Lord tells them to 
to uh, use the rod to get water from the rock. And uh, in verse 10, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, here now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his rod twice. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank in their cattle. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the sons of Israel contended with the Lord, and he showed himself holy among them. So they don't enter the promised land. So then remember the author, or maybe not remembered because it was so long ago. <clears throat> Psalm 95, starting with the last part of verse 7. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, <laughs> as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I was wearied of that generation and said, they are a people who err in heart and they do not regard my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger they should not enter my rest. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice and not listening to his voice implies that you, like the wilderness generation, don't enter his rest. So the rest they were entering is the promised land the land overflowing with milk and honey, which they were unable to enter. <coughs> but the psalm implies that there's a rest greater than that rest, greater than the land overflowing with milk and honey and the promised land. So therefore, that rest has to be the ultimate rest, with the rest in the promised land merely pointing forward to the ultimate rest in the heavenly city. And then also remember that from Genesis on the seventh day, God rested. And the author says that chapter four, verse three, for we who have believed enter that rest as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, he said, they shall never enter my rest. So God rested on the seventh day. God, in fact, can't rest. Because if God rests, the universe falls apart. God's resting indicates that his activity in creation is complete. And so activity in creation is complete and there's rest. So that rest is created from the foundation of the world. It's part of God's creative activity which means that that rest becomes the destination <clears throat> to which God's creation longs and will return, will go. And so rest, therefore, predates the promise and the promised land. Rest is intrinsic to God's creative activity. So since then, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph were sojourners in the land of the promise, they 
must have looked forward to a greater promise. That promise is the rest, and the rest is the heavenly city. So the author has really built a closely reasoned argument in which he's used the Old Testament. And so notice, of course, he's not a biblical literalist. Far from it. So he's really reimagined large parts of the Old Testament and the Old Testament story, focusing on particular things, focusing on you know the, the answers to you know, questions he has to have asked asked himself in the process of you know wondering about Christ and wondering about the implications of returning to temple Judaism. So does that, does that make sense? Does that, does everyone see that? <laughs> I guess the answer is not. Okay, so the big thing is, is we have to you know step back for a moment. I mean, we're, we are, you know, kind of embedded in 2,000 years of Christianity. And it's often important to unembed oneself. And so the question is, how do we get here? And so remember, the New Testament doesn't exist. This is written... I mean, obviously, you know, we've discussed that it's disputed, but this is written before the destruction of the temple, mm -hmm. probably written before the, the Roman Jewish war. So it's written comparatively early. The author is probably an associate of Paul, but we can't be completely certain. Paul's letters are early, uh, and those probably circulating. But the author's theology is also distinctly, sharply different from Paul's. So you're a Jewish Christian. That means that much of your faith tradition involves Torah, it involves the hope being the return from the diaspora, the regathering of God's people in the holy city. And then it involves faith in Christ as the Messiah. And so then the question becomes, what does faith in Christ mean? How are we to understand the Christ and what Christ has called us to do versus and the new covenant, therefore, versus the old covenant? And so remember, the old covenant promises are predominantly material. There's the promised land. There's land overflowing with milk and honey. There's uh, the Mosaic law. There's you know stringent adherence to the Mosaic law. And so, but the old, so, but the only scripture is the old, is the Old Testament. There's no New Testament. I mean, this is, will be included in it, but, you know, 
we don't know what the author, whether anything else has circulated and what the author has read. And probably the gospels are just being written. And in fact, you know, again, many, many scholars think that they're written after 70, which I mean, only John's gospel is, I think. But so in many ways, you know, the author is on his own. So, you know, as we look at the text, we kind of, uh, it's not, we can't kind of cross-reference it to other New Testament texts, you know, and be in a rigorous way. I mean, we can point to similarities, but they don't prove anything because the author hasn't used them. And so then the question becomes, how does this person who is nailed to a tree, which is a curse, become the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? So the author responds liturgically that he is priest and victim and eschatologically. And so those two things are really the heart of his argument. Christ is high priest. Christ intercedes for us, the throne room of God. The covenant has been violated, the old covenant. The penalty for covenant violation is death. Christ's death satisfies the requirements of the old covenant. We will violate the new covenant. Christ's death satisfies that as well. And because of that, God's eschatological promises are made available to the old covenant people. And so, therefore, Our ultimate, so the, the point of entering, so remember he argues that God's rest is a present reality and a future reality. We can, should, must enter God's rest now. We also will enter God's rest in the heavenly city. God's kingdom is here and now. God's kingdom is future. For the patriarchs, he argues that there was a recognition that there was a better future divorced from earthly promises. Yeah. So does that does that help to put anything everything in anything in somewhat better context? Mm -hmm. One well, of verse ten, he says, "For he was talking about Abraham um, was he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and maker is God." Mm -hmm. And then when. Um, Verses as he has prepared a city for them. And then verse 16. And then Jesus talked about, you know, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Although, remember, John's gospel is written uh, around 100. It's very, very late. John was still alive, wasn't he? John was still alive, yeah. So he could have said it. I mean, it wasn't necessarily written, but if he... Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. I, I'm still a little confused. Uh -huh. in that, okay, so God's house is 
is here on earth while we're here. That's one place. And then the next place is uh, is in heaven. It's not some or God's kingdom. Kingdom in God's kingdom in heaven. But that won't happen until in Christ. God's kingdom on earth. Well, God's kingdom on earth that's that's the now, right? Right. And then after we die, we some we will enter heaven only after Christ returns. Because we don't enter right into the kingdom of God. And well, and so and so I, I, I'm not no we eventually that will happen, but I mean no we do enter heaven. Yeah, I, that, that's where I'm a little but, wrong. But the question really is is one of of a uh, resurrection. Resurrection happens after the second coming. Okay, so on death we're in the kingdom, but we're not resurrected. No. Then what are we in the kingdom? We're spirits. Spirit. Souls. Oh. Well, you know that's kind of radical for me. <laughs> Re resurrection means having a body. Ah, you know, I, I, I remember in my youth and we talked about the kingdom of God and we mentioned the fact that there were different views on, on the kingdom that you didn't go there to see your relative. You were there as a spirit, as a soul, and you were just in the presence of God. But the concept we have now is that on the second coming, that soul will have a body. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. I like that. Well, I, you, you know, I'm, I always thought that was going to happen. But then when we had discussions about not happening until after the second coming, um, then, then what I believed from before was that we're all souls. And that, you know, to say that I'm going to be greeted by my my family soul was not going to happen. I mean, we're just going to be all souls in the presence well, of spirits. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I got to let this, I got to let my, my brain wrap, wrap around this because it, it has to, I have to feel comfortable with it. I, I thought I was comfortable before, but when I see, I see the clarity in it. On the on the resurrection, yeah. So he's pointing to remember going back to um, the confession of our hope in chapter ten, in verse twenty three. He says, "Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful." And let us stir up, etc. And and. Uh, he says, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the day is the day of the Lord, which is the second coming. So that's the confession of our hope. The confession of our hope is the second coming. And particularly... Although I just you know cautioned against this uh, in chapter twenty and twenty one of Revelation, we have the heavenly city, and in fact, I mean, in general, the heavenly city is an important part not only of of Christian but of Jewish eschatology and, and apocalyptic writing as well. In chapter twenty we have the second coming. We have the final judgment in chapter 20, verse 11. Then in chapter 21, we have verse one, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. 
And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And then in verse chapter 22, verse 1, Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall no more be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship him. <coughs> they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And night shall be no more. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they shall reign forever and ever. And his name shall be on their foreheads. The high priest on his, uh, was it on his turban? I think on his turban had uh, a gold piece of uh, gold metal inscribed holy to the Lord. So that points forward to this. So the heavenly, the heavenly city, the reunification of heaven and earth, uh, a unification of the material, of the physical and spiritual, and all things become sacred. All things become holy. Zechariah has talks about the. Uh, cooking utensils being sacred and horses on their uh, reins or whatever that being inscribed with holy to the Lord. So they too are sacred. All things are sacred. All things are sacramental. One other thing really important, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. So they're sojourners. They look forward to the heavenly city. He says, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So therefore, God is honored to be called their God. But, but the point is that there is a therefore there. And the therefore is that there are sojourners seeking a heavenly city, looking forward to a heavenly city, recognizing that this is not their home. And because of that, God is honored to be called their God, proud to be called their God. So then the question for us becomes, do we see ourselves as sojourners and pilgrims on this earth? Or are we dug in here? Is this, is this it? Because, you know, I mean, the problem is for, I would say for most American Christians today, this is it. Mm -hmm. That's really what Christian nationalism is all about. This is it. Yeah. Now, now, we're supposed to live our life with God, with the goal of being in union with God. Mm -hmm. Kingdom. 
and and death on earth is just the beginning of our journey it's it's, it's all we've got a place to go <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one way or another we're going to be judged right yes. we're all going to be yes. judged but, one way uh, the the question yeah i mean i think is how many christians think that they can have their cake and eat it too many 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 yeah many many shout god's name all over the place and they are good and holy but it's just in the front there's there's nothing happening in the back you know they they've lost they've lost the faith in the back they're just showing it up, up, up front, you know. And that's what gets me. Yeah, Christian nationalism particularly has become, you know, a real, uh, well, a real danger and a real threat. Uh, you know, so how would you define it? Uh, well, people who believe that this is this nation was established as a godly nation that it was um, you know the legal system is based upon judeo-christian principles that god has blessed this nation because it is a christian nation it may have and, been, but I don't think it is now. Well, it, <laughs> well isn't I mean, it more so now than, than historically? It was? Yeah. Historically, it never has been. Yeah, I mean, the the founding fathers were so. I mean, there's been so-called Christian historians have done you know like a lot of research on you know all of this stuff and you know have shown that you know christian nation established based on christian principles but, but the, the problem is you know as as a historian you formulate a hypothesis then you examine the evidence in a critical way to see whether your hypothesis is sustained and you adjust the data accordingly. Uh, I mean, you adjust your hypothesis accordingly. So it's not exactly as you know, precise as the scientific method, but it's you know similar. Mm -hmm. But you can also simply formulate your hypothesis and go and gather the data to support it, right? And that's what bad historians do. And that's what Christian historians have done. So a few of the founding fathers were Christians. Most were deists. Uh, you know, so if you want to take a, so I think I've talked about the Jefferson Bible before, put together by Thomas Jefferson. And so like you too, you pulled out pages or something. You create your own Jefferson Bible. Yeah. So yeah. you begin by finding <laughs> the page that separates Matthew from the Old Testament, tear out the Old Testament and throw it away. Then go to the end of John, where between John and Acts, and uh, tear out Acts and everything after it and throw that away. So now you have, you know, the Gospels. Now you need to get out a pair of scissors and paste. And then you cut out everything you don't like. And then what you're left with is, you know, your own private Bible, just like Jefferson's Bible. So that's not exactly, you know, Christian methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, so that whole notion that we were founded as a godly nation is absurd. The The notion that our legal system is based on Judeo-Christian principles is ridiculous. It's based on Roman law. 
everything, including the church or the, the Western church for much of its history was based, canon law is based on Roman law. Hmm. And the church, you know, sort of inspired the legal system, the Catholic church inspired the legal systems of most of Western Europe. So that's Roman law. The, um, the notion that we're a godly nation was um, first advanced in the 1950s by a very godly organization called the National Association of Manufacturers. If, if, if you can imagine anything more godly, let me know. Um, in opposition to what they perceived as um, FDR's, you know, sort of anti-business thrust and his frequent use of, of particularly uh, Exodus imagery, which really galled them. So this whole notion of, of you know, and then we have, you know, we've been, we've, we're a nation that drifted away from God, but nobody agrees on what it was that drifted us away from God. You know, for some it's Roe versus Wade, for some it's um, the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And, you know, for some it's whatever, uh, you know, there, there's a good deal of diversity in what it is. So in any case, the whole thing is, you know, just an artificially constructed narrative. And, but, you know, we can see, you know, part of the, the, uh, the notion that we're a godly nation is, you know, a call to preserve our uniqueness as a godly nation. And so keep out foreigners. They're the people who uh, are poisoning our blood. So, you know, so we see that, you know, particularly with Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Lauren Bobarts. Uh, but generally, you know, I mean, that's the appeal. That's a major concern of Christian nationalism. The, the poisoning our blood comes from Mount Mein Kampf, which, which uh, Trump quotes. Um, he has, um, you know, foreigners poisoning our blood and those who disagree with him are vermin. That also comes from Mein Kampf. So uh, Christian nationalism very much And salvation is an event, so you're assured of it. You don't have to, as Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's assured, so in the meantime, you can dig in here and uh, persecute and oppress others. So that's Christian nationalism. And, you know, I mean, it's a, at this point has become a major strain of Christianity. And probably in America today, the predominant strain of Christianity. So we always have to remember, we, we not only have to remember that we're sojourners, we have to be sojourners. We look forward to the heavenly city. And then also remember that the city is, is a social construct it's a social organization so it's not really again the author is is you know very concerned with the people of god it's the people of god and not you know individual individuals who inhabit the heavenly city he's concerned with 
the people of God, people of God must be sojourners on this earth. Then we must look forward to the heavenly city. And indeed the heavenly city is, will be glorious. That, uh, that is the confidence of our hope. That is our hope. 